I like to get to know my audience just a little bit. Um, how many people are uh, like accounting or finance types in this thing? Great. And how many are IT people? And how many are something else? <laughs> and that is your misfortune, to be sure, right, in this crowd? Because this is all about, uh, about that. So as Johnny said, first and foremost, I am an engineer. So my question for you is, how many people find that distressing? <laughs> yeah, there you go. How many find that reassuring? How many people are waiting to see what I have to say? <laughs> right, yeah, that's how it's going down here. So how did I actually get here? Um, it was funny. My predecessor resigned suddenly. And um, then what happened was th the company spent nine months looking at every other possible option <laughs> to do this job, and then decided on me. And my friends call me Plan C. <laughs> I won't tell you what my enemies call me, but my friends call me Plan C, OK? And so that's why when Johnny called me at the last minute, <laughs> it kind of was of a pattern of my life, is the way it went down. Yeah. So a couple of survey questions, too. And this is, really, this is how you get to really know people. Um, how many people here get to work before 8 AM? Yeah, that's the accounting thing in you guys. <laughs> if you make a checklist, OK, and you have a checklist that's done, and you're checking stuff off, and something's new that comes up that wasn't on your checklist, but you just finished it, how many of you actually write it down and then cross it off? And how many of you back into your parking spaces? <laughs> yeah, that's the weirdest one of all. <laughs> uh, I don't get it. I don't get it. Safety for what? Sa this for the zombie apocalypse, right? <laughs> They're now here. I've got my survival bag in the car. And I can run them over as I leave the parking lot, <laughs> right out of the spot. So. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying real hard, because Holly did a great job here. But um, so partnership, what do I mean by that? Well, you're all accomplished people. And I'm not here to tell you probably anything you don't know. But I'm sort of going to try to weave it together, hopefully, into what I think is a, is a framing idea for professional services businesses of our time right now. So. Um, Got a couple of things. You know, why, why would I say that partnership? I just think key organizing principle of our time, treating each other like partners, whether it's your clients, your employees, your colleagues, any of the people that you work with. And I'm going to go in and talk about that a little bit more. But first, I had an opportunity to talk about GEI and myself, which, of course, takes precedence over everything. So if you don't know who we are, this is what we do. Civil engineering firm. I'd say if, you, if uh, it's got water, soil in the ground, structures, that kind of work, that's who we are. That's what we do. Those are our locations. There really are dots on our map in Iron River, Michigan. Has anyone been to Iron River, Michigan? <laughs> Why? <laughs> there, you went to Michigan? Oh, I see. There you go. Actually, I'm kidding. It's a great place. But you wouldn't get there from a market study. You get there because the right kind of people with the right kind of clients and the right kind of business want to join your organization. And that's how we got there, and I point that out. And again, I think you'll see as I go on, that is a reflection, too, of your partnership, because that is truly a people-based strategy. And by that, I mean you're trying to attract the, the right kind of people for your business, your operation, and they may be anywhere. And that's really the essence of this. This is a combination of organic growth, 
you know, an acquisition here. Somewhere else we did an acquisition. I could, yeah, here we go, in New York. Um, groups of people joining us, dissatisfied with uh, their lot in life. <laughs> At their current em former employers, not necessarily because they live in, on the shores of Lake Michigan, so. And then a quick look at who we are. Again, these specialists, these are like those other people that are here. They're not the finance, they're not the engineers. But we've gotten to a point where we're 800 people. Now that's pretty, that's pretty spread out for all those offices. It's still, there's a lot of small offices in that mix. Here's the kind of work we do. That is a facade of a building that is standing in a bunch of spindly pipes. Whoops. Sorry about that. So this is a uh, cathedral in Utah that had burned down the inside of it and it needed to be preserved. And they wanted to put an entire basement and center around it. So of course, the obvious way to do that is to put a bunch of pipes underneath of it and dig out all around it. Somebody on my, of my esteemed colleagues uh, actually took responsibility for that. So those of you risk managers in the room, you're going. <laughs> you're clutching. I was. Here's another one. Highest hazard dam in the country in Kentucky. So of course we wanted to do it, because who wouldn't want that risk? This is actually a machine, and these are people. This is the largest piece of equipment for drilling 250 feet through the dam into the ground underneath of it to try to stop it from leaking really bad. And why is that a problem? Because Nashville's about 45 minutes down the, down the stream, so it could flood. Dams and levees, more floods, more people hoping that we are good partners and do our job. This is a railroad bridge. Nothing remarkable except that it was replaced in 48 hours torn down. It was replaced by having a precast set up. This looked like a Broadway production or a military event. Everything had to hit the marks every minute, every last second of it. The real issue was the train couldn't stop for more than 48 hours. So you can replace the bridge. So now when your town or your local government tells you that it will take nine months to replace a bridge, you know otherwise. <laughs> Years. So why partnership? Why an organizing principle? A couple of things. I think it's a great point of differentiation. Because as you well know, there was a time, I was told, because I'm not that old, but there was a time when professionals had monopolies on knowledge, information, skills. You know, you, you now have people who come to you and they've been self-educated. They get information on the internet. They're not coming to you for some exclusive purview or of knowledge. They're coming to you because they need collaborators, because they need help, because they need somebody who's going to help solve their problem. And I think the way I like to think about that is, a, is some personal examples. If I think of my grandparents, their world and their association with professionals was driven by awe. Those were people that they trusted implicitly and entirely and just whatever they said, ministers, teachers, doctors, lawyers, they knew what, what my grandparents didn't know and they were right and that was it. They didn't ask them questions, they didn't do anything with them. Even my parents, reluctant to ask questions to the doctors, maddening conversation. So how did that visit go with the doctor? Did you ask, did you tell him about this? Well, no, he didn't ask. Well, why is he gonna ask? Why don't you bring that up? Well, he would know to ask. <laughs> Maybe you've had these conversations before in your life. When I go to the doctor, my doctor says, what do I think the problem is? What have I done to, to look at myself and, and go to have that conversation? And then we collaborate around a solution. I find that much more satisfying. I find it much more productive. And I don't know how I would do it in any other way anyway. 
So that's my paradigm of the evolution of any professional practice, of any business right now. People are educated. Your clients are educated. Your service providers are educated. It's about who do you want to work with? Who do you, who's best going to be fit what you want to do? I think in, in another way to say it would be in 1970, I could imagine a decision maker saying, I need an expert to tell me what to do. I think the comment today would be, I need experts who understand my business, who I want to work with, and can get me a solution. If you want to think about, in my mind, the way I see that switch turn. So when I'm talking about partnership, I have a specific definition in mind. I think the first two are fairly straightforward. It's the third point that takes it from just good behavior, I think, into an organizing principle, into a cultural attribute of an organization. Because if everyone in your organization does the right thing because they owe it to each other, not because anyone has a stick at their back or they're making them do it, it makes life so much easier. Because you just trust that people are trying to do the right thing and getting it done. So that's what I'm talking about, is that extended idea of that partnership, with that behavior as a key piece. I didn't get there alone. Johnny was very polite in saying I had a lot of doing shaping it. Really, my, the, our former C CEO, Frank Leathers, was the one who really brought this together. But I kind of bought into it because I had my own journey to get there. First thing I'm going to point out is, there ought to be a law against these glasses. I mean, <laughs> this is unbelievable. I don't know what my mother even, I, how did I even buy these? So very successful engineer, successful marketing person, believe it or not, successful owner of a construction company. <laughs> This guy's in prison. <laughs> I'll tell you that story on the boat tonight if you want. So I start with GEI. It's small. It's collegial. Five founders. High deference to these people. Yes, we are collegial in this, but we call them doctor. Doctor so-and-so. Because they have PhDs, right? Because that's important. We call them doctor. And like I said, in retrospect, it felt a bit like grad school. But there's strong commitment to you know, having our internal transition, ownership transition, held it together through uh, some, some struggle. There they are. There was no color in their life, actually. They are black and white when they walk <laughs> around. They're doctor so-and-so. So. Shortly after I join, I'm in the mid-90s, I work it for a few years, their retirement comes along. And uh, they don't all retire at once, and they're slowly being bought out, but this is kind of an existential crisis for the organization, because they're big owners, and we owe them a lot of money, and there's not a lot of going on. It's also becoming apparent that there isn't really an organizing principle in the company that's bigger than they are. It's about who they are, right? For them, leadership means knowing the answers, and they know the answers. They are the ultimate arbiter of what is right or not. So there's collaboration, but it's kind of like sitting at the kids' table at Thanksgiving, if you know what I mean. You're there, but you're not quite. I owe them a lot, but this wasn't going to get us to the next step, is my point. This is not where it's going to go. Also had these false paradigms floating around in trying to do this. I'm sure none of you have ever heard these kind of comments before. You know, somebody said something, yeah? yeah. You're right there, yeah? So, is it quality work or making money? Because I can't do both. You know, uh, it's our clients. They all suck. They're terrible. <laughs> I actually had one guy, I actually had one guy tell me this would be great, and he was serious. This wasn't like irony. This would be great if I could, if we just, I didn't have clients if I could do this work. <laughs> so 
to like engineering in heaven kind of a thing where you'd go and <laughs> the unicorns and the rainbows come out and hand you work and that's the end of that. And it mirrored, I think what was going on was this group of people who are kind of bereft of what was the organizing principle. What was going to happen next after these dominant personalities? It wasn't stupid people by any means. So I go to, I go to get an MBA. That's what I do. I bail out. <laughs> Take a break. Had enough. Had my, uh, what I call my first midlife crisis. I'm re reserving a second for whenever I need that. <laughs> I don't know when that'll be. But this may not sound like a big one, but this was big for, for people in my organization. Our business is really not different than any other one. Holy cow. I was speaking heresy, man. I was there to burn me and leave me at the stake. Because much of the world was based on the belief that you either couldn't be more successful or you couldn't achieve this or couldn't create that because somehow the nature of this business was in and of itself limiting. You know, financially limiting, opportunity limiting, whatever it was. And as far as I could tell, we didn't look a lot different than an airline. And people hated that analogy. They hated that analogy of being like an airline. But why was that? Because there was only really two things going on for us. How much were we selling the seats, i.e. hours for, and how many of our seats were filled every day when the, when the thing flew away, when the hours flew away. And that was it. Everything else was fixed costs and the rest of that. And there were known techniques. So I was sat in this class, and this guy went through, and he goes, here's this thing called the founder's gap. This is what happens. Entrepreneurs, startup people, they found a company, and they bring it to a point. They struggle. They don't know how to professionalize the organization. They don't know how to bring it to the next place. They don't know how to make it more of an institutionally based culture than a personality, their personality driven culture. And it's right there in the literature. And as long as you can see a problem, in my view, you can confront it. Number three was big for me because here I was in business school. I had resigned. I thought. Jesus, I'm going to go out. I'm going to Wall, School, Wall Street. I'm going to be an investment banker. I'm going to do something. I'm going to make boatloads of money, big boats of money. And then I decided I hated everybody I was with, pretty much, because they would, they would like kill their grandmother for more money. Not all of them, but most of them. And more than that, they just weren't collegial. I actually was in, in circumstances where people like sabotaged each other's you know, presentations and that kind of thing. The antithesis of the kind of collaboration we're talking about here. So I liked GI, I liked my industry, liked those people, but I thought there was a, uh, an opportunity for, a, for a, uh, a little bit of a different business perspective in that. And part of it was framed up in a story that I'd say, it occurred to me that one of the reasons people on like Wall Street, like have you seen The Big Short? Seen that movie? Nobody's seen that movie, are you kidding me? Yeah, right. So would you want to work with those guys? I don't think so. Profanity-laden tirades at each other all day long, screaming, calling each other stuff I won't say. But you'd make a lot of money if you did. If you could put up with that for a while, you could like, you didn't live too large, you could stash away some money. And then you could walk away, do your vineyard, or hit the beach, make your own, whatever it was you wanted to do. So the revolution for me was, I wasn't going to do that. Because you, know, you could put up with a lot of, of, of crabby people. I was going to go back, and I was going to have to work till I was at least, I don't know, 65. So my revelation was, if that was the case, I really needed to work with people I like to be with all the time. People who were good partners. People who respected each other. Didn't undermine each other. And that really was GEI, but it wasn't, it was the happenstance of it, not the culture of it. So I go back, and there I am again. Sands the awful glasses. I'm sort of not happy. I don't know why. The only person that's more unhappy in this picture, Angie, <laughs> who's back there right now sitting in a chair, by the way. I have no idea why she looks like that. 
Everyone else thinks this is great. So I, so I put that, I, I started trying to work to put that at work, you know. I want to work with others to create a company, you know, that values the good work and good practices together. It was not an or, it was a both, number one. And with people who treat each other well like partners. There you go. I am really happy. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay, for the animation. So trying to turn it into more of a unifying concept. What does it mean in practice, in my, in my view of it? What are you trying, or what am I trying to achieve? Because it's always a try. You never get there. You're never there in these sorts of things. So I always go to Dilbert when I need something to frame up. There's still a woman sitting in front who's going, wait, they're making fun of accountants in that. <laughs> That's not fair. I think what is clear here is uh, Dilbert's not feeling the partnership, is he? Not really. Nope. Because whether or not he gets his head chopped off, literally, he's going to get made felt stupid, for sure. Uh, he's wasting somebody's time. And more importantly, he feels like he's working on a different set of priorities, even though they're in the same company trying to achieve the same thing. Somehow, they're going in a different place. We don't have any trolls in my office, no, at least not anymore. Got rid of them. So partnership and practice, what does it mean? What are you explaining to people? I think it's a simple unifying concept, partnership. It really works in almost every dimension you're trying to, to achieve. Because if you're trying to weave together 30 offices, like plus offices like we are, or 40 like I said on the other slide, because I can't, can't really count on my somewhere in between 30 and 40, um, you, you get to a point where you're, no one is going to meet each other. I mean, there are people that will never meet each other. But why were they going to be good? Why were they going to work together? How do they trust each other? You know, you organize that by, again, what do we owe each other? What's the partnership issues going on here? And then the basis is to say, I can expect my partners to do whatever the agreed upon right thing is because we've all agreed that that's what we're going to do because that's the kind of culture we have. I mean, I think that's attractive also to the kind of people you might want to recruit. If you're looking like we are for entre entrepreneurial minded, uh, seller doers who are looking for kind of a, a, a little more freedom of action, not a lot of bureaucracy. Well, this is how it happens. Because the bureaucrats, the suffocating controls, when do they show up? When people don't do the right thing, when they don't treat each other like partners, when they have to be made to do the right thing. Compulsion is the, is the absolute enemy of a professional services firm. It also matches the expectations of the best clients. If you're trying to get the best clients, what do they want? They want people who are collaborators, partners. They want people that understand their business, are going to learn about them. You know, and it's, it's the strong service provider relationships. It's why we use BST, quite frankly. They work with us as partners and embody that kind of, kind of approach and culture. That's how I choose my bank. I don't go and figure out who's got the best rates and the rest of that. Who's going to be my best banking partner? Who's going to be my best accounting partner? Who's my best legal partner? The collaborators, the people who actually figure out what's going on. So it works inwardly with your clients, downstream with your own, with your own service providers. That's why it's really attractive to me, because I don't have to have like a multifaceted approach to more stuff. But there are obstacles, right? This is where it's, uh, as I say, it's simple. I have just said that everyone's going like, nod your head, yeah, that's great. But again, Tom's talking more consulting in heaven. This is how it goes. Like, oh, what are the obstacles? 
Number one. I cannot find a better word to describe the people. <laughs> Honest to God. That make this not work if you're trying to do it. And again, I'm not an original thinker on this, I'm sure. <laughs> and there's even a book, if you want, by I think a Harvard Business School professor called The No Asshole Rule, which goes into depth on this. But what are we talking about when I'm, I'm not talking about people that like have a moment here. These are the people I'm talking about, right? They're habitually self-serving, always going back to their own interests, needs, whims, and hang-ups. They're high, high maintenance. I'm looking at your faces and none of you know these people. None of you know what I'm talking about, right? This is, this is, this is my problem, right? Can't satisfy them. Because there's always another mountain to climb with these people, with their, 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 whatever their disaffection and their problem is. You just, just got to keep going. And then they have the unmitigated gall to do this on you. They're the truth tellers. <laughs> They're telling you what other people are afraid to hear, that I'm great, and I need to be served, and I'm the one that's creating all the value in this organization. They're bullies, basically, but that's what they think they are. And in my experience, they're tolerated in surprising numbers in this business. Because there's some magic that they have with clients that makes them somehow desirable and to have this miserable trade-off with them as you work with them internally. And they design and they sabotage their way through your organization. So I had this dream. What if all the assholes were gone? Poof, what if they went away? What would happen? I know, it's a fantasy, but you get productive meetings. You get supported solutions. And you focus externally. Oh my God. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle. And I, and I make a joke about it. But at least in my organization, it was hard to say, you know what? We're better without those people. Something will be lost, but we can't get hung up on what will be lost. We have to be focused on what we're gaining. We're gaining something for everyone, and the applause will resonate through the building. And what else do we have, I think? So the number two problem of the obstacle, trust, or lack of it. This is kind of a corollary, because so once you get rid of the assholes, because no one trusts them anyway, because that's a problem, you're still going to have this in some form or another. And some of it's based in some real stuff, like, how do you trust people you never met and you see that they're on the phone? Do people have to earn trust? Like, is there a test? What do you make your new staff do to, before you say you're going to trust them to call somebody at the other end and do a job? And who makes that decision? My head hurts when I think about it. It's like just too complicated, too complicated. And then there's some people who just like use the trust card as the reason not to do anything. I don't trust that person. What do you want me to do about it? I can't trust them. They haven't done. Why don't you trust them? I don't know. I don't like the way they look. There are people who use that to opt out. So my proposition is the better approach. You assume the trust and then deal with the people who screw it up. Everybody trusts each other, and then deal with the exceptions. It works a lot better, in my experience. Because otherwise, you're stuck. You're stuck in a useless paradigm of who can I trust? We've got to build trust. We need some meetings. We need some like, people to fly together, come sit in a room. Can we do some team building? You know, that would be great. Well, maybe it will. 
but to what end? So when I thought about this and I wrote, wrote it back into BS10, T10, early on in this, I put up being good partners. What does that mean? So when I, why was I into BST10 in the beginning? Because this is the paradigm of life. It's not even about being better than eight or anything else. I mean, I have a generation of people whose expectation is like their financial system should work like their, their credit card website. They turn on, they don't get training for that. They turn it on, poke around, drop the menu, move this over here, pick that, go there, do this. Nobody gets trained. Why do they need to be trained? They just want to open the thing up and it actually will point them where they need to go. So that was what, what, what was it. I had a fairly number of uh, conversations with Johnny and Stan around those lines. And I thought, well, that's a, good, that's a good alignment point with BST. We're sort of building that future that I need. But what does it mean for everyone that's in, in my ex experience, to be on the business side? So now we'll turn it around. You know, when, when I was doing that asshole thing, everyone was like, oh, yeah, I know who those people are in this. But now the question is, what are we, as internal professionals, as people serving organizations, what are we doing? How are we reaching out our half of the way? Are we, are we doing all that we can the right way? In professional services firms, the currency of the land is client relationships. The, the dynamics, the paradigm is client relationships. So we all need to treat our people like internal clients. Simple enough. I think that, that's what they understand, that's what they appreciate, and that's what, um, again, puts us on common footing. Number two is kind of important, I think. You know, sometimes it seems easy but we're trying to solve common problems. You look at it with number three. People come to you and they're raving and you know some kind of problem they have. They hate the system. It won't do this. It won't do that for you. They are trying to solve a problem. If they could solve it themselves, they would because they can't stand coming to see you guys, right? That's, that's going back to Dilbert with the heads being chopped off thing and the rest of that. Yeah. So the most important thing there is not to have the, client, the, the compliance mindset, I think you know, working with my staff. It's the thing I try to emphasize all the time. We're not here to make people do things. We're here to help them get stuff done. And then climb in the ring. It's amazing. We set up systems. We're accounts payable people and people that review expense reports never travel. They never produce an expense report. They've never sat in an airport bar at 2 in the morning on a Sunday, not at home. And the last thing anybody wants to hear is, why did you order a second beer <laughs> and put it on your expense report? Because it was 2 AM on Sunday, and I was in an airport bar. We have billers who've never been in boots on a construction site, who don't really grasp what it means to try to right things in a driving hailstorm wearing full rain gear, and it's 4 in the evening, and you've been out there for 10 hours sucking diesel fumes all day long. It's easy, to, it's easy to cast it in reverse. People don't know what my job's like. I just, you know, this and that. But if you're going to adopt that perspective, have you been, have you ever spent time living the other half? And finally, the goal, regardless of what you're doing, you know what? Systems and processes, and this is going to sound so painfully simple, but, and lots of you probably do it anyway. But, make it, but, but wouldn't the, the best alignment is to get your processes to be the best way to do something, the easiest way to do it, and then people will do it. It's not always easy to get there, 
But as a conceptual concept, it certainly expresses partnership if you can at least tell people that's what you're trying to do. Hey, it may not seem like this. We're really, really trying to have the way we need things to be to be the easiest way for you guys to do it, subject to certain limits. And then you can do all the fine print on the bottom as to why it's really not going to be like that, <laughs> or at least the way they would imagine it. So now you get into BST 10. And for me, again, looking at these kinds of dashboards and what they do, this is the expectation. This is an expression of partnership, not necessarily just between us and BST, but this is the expression of partnership to our consultants and the people that our internal clients. How do we make doing the right thing the easy thing? How do we make it go there? Because now, the compliance side of the world becomes much easier if I have taken away every possible excuse not to know what's going on with your job, right? Because this is the problem. You know, you go to somebody and you're like, hey, um, uh, I got a question about your, uh, your, your, your project there for a second. Can, can we get a minute? No. <laughs> Force field goes up. I don't know what you're talking. What, what important client billable things do you not want me to do to do your thing? <laughs> Who do you want me to disappoint? What money don't you want me to bill? <laughs> and you're going, yeah, I didn't think that was the question I was going to ask, but. So now it's sort of like, hey, you turn on your machine, and if you can look at your credit card statement, which I know you can, because you do it during work. Because <laughs> I manage IT, too. <laughs> and we have a robust surveillance operation going on. <laughs> and if you can operate your DraftKings sportsbook thing while you're sitting there at lunch, you should be able to do this. I mean, I had a guy once, so I had this engineer. And he was telling a story one week about how he had found an error in this analytical program for doing some complicated foundation analysis that he was working on. And he found the error. He hacked the code of this thing, figured out how to fix it, then called the people who wrote it, told them about the error, collaborated with them to get it fixed, and had it reissued. The next week, I asked him about a project, and he said, that BST thing is too complicated. <laughs> I swear to God, this happened. I, really, I didn't make that. I could not make up a story like that. So take away the excuses. You know, the, other, the other thing I tell people is, too many people in our business are like viper snakes. They're like, <laughs> They're in your face. They're like making you try to do something. Be a boa constrictor. <laughs> Smile at your prey. <laughs> Engage with them. Wrap another coil around them. <laughs> and then wrap another coil around them. And kind of just, that's what this lets me do, by the way. There is no excuse for not knowing what the hell is going on on your job. You like that Cobra thing, eh? Oh, there you go. You getting the coils ready? You know, just do the wrap. And, and so that just brings me to the end and say, you know, 20 years with BST. Uh, Third time, we're migrating to a different solution. I don't even know what the thing we had before Enterprise was called, to be honest with you. Salesman, Johnny? There you go. MIS. There you go, MIS, thank you. And that's because I was on the engineering, I hate accounting side of the world in those days. But now we're getting into the third migration, and we're really looking forward to what that's going to be able to do for us. And with that, 
Questions? Thank you all very much.